Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Two weeks ago, Governor Wolf gave his 2017-2018 budget address in front of the state legislature, his third budget address as governor. Today, we are so pleased to be joined by Governor Wolf, who will be here to answer your questions from Facebook on his plan for Pennsylvania. Welcome. Thanks, Megan. And I just want to give you an opportunity before we get to all the great questions we've gotten on Facebook uh, over the weekend, just kind of walk us through what this third budget is all about. Um, it's a little bit different than the past two. It is. Uh, it's a different approach, I think, to, to budgeting. The, the, in the past, we've been given a, a choice between um, paying more or, or getting less. And, and what I'm trying to do here is say, I'm not going to raise broad-based, I'm not proposing raising broad-based taxes. And what I'm proposing uh, still is an increase in things that people in Pennsylvania care about, like education, like the opioid epidemic, uh, like seniors, like jobs. Uh, government ought to be uh, helping uh, provide services surrounding those areas. Those are things that are of interest to people of Pennsylvania. I'm doing that in my budget. That's what I proposed without raising taxes. Great. And just a reminder, these questions have been submitted by Pennsylvania citizens on Governor Wolf's Facebook page, where we are holding a live town hall right now. And we have a lot of questions to get to. Um, we're going to start with uh, sort of the news out of Washington these days, which is the Affordable Care Act uh, being in flux. And so Julie would like to know, how will block grants from the federal government affect your budget? Uh, Julie, that's a great question. I don't think anybody knows at this point. Uh, here's what we do know. Uh, over the last two years, um, 700,000 Pennsylvanians have gotten health insurance, didn't have it before. Uh, over 120,000 Pennsylvanians are getting treatment. Uh, they can now have treatment and pay for it uh, for opioid, for substance use disorder. Uh, those are things that Pennsylvanians now have. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen in Washington, but whatever happens, uh, I think the people in Washington have to recognize that there will be severe consequences if any of those 700,000 people find themselves without health insurance or any of those 120 some thousand people find themselves without the ability to get treatment for opioid substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to property tax. Um, we got a lot of questions about uh, House Bill 76 and just uh, a lot of folks weighing in and saying they can no longer afford the massive school property tax. Um, Wendy from Monroe County says I cannot retire in Pennsylvania because I won't have enough to pay my school tax bill and I don't want to move but I will have no choice, she says. Um, so can you address sort of what your plan or what your hope for property tax reform would be in Pennsylvania? Yeah, and, and Wendy's point is absolutely <clears throat> right, that there are people who are being forced out of their homes because of, of increasing uh, property taxes to fund public education. Uh, I ran on the issue of, uh, of property tax relief. Um, and that's uh, up to and including property tax elimination for the purpose of funding public education. Uh, we simply cannot uh, have a system uh, that, that uh, forces people out of their homes as, as our main source of funding for, for the education for, for our children. We need that education. We need our children to get that education. We can't do it at the expense of our, of our citizens who are being forced out of their homes. And you've, you've talked to Republicans and Democrats across the aisle. I, I have talked to Republicans and Democrats um, uh, of all political stripes. And, and I think there is, there is real uh, appetite for real property tax reform. Uh, I think the, the discussion debate has to be around how we do that, how we implement it, the transition. Uh, but I think people in this building get it. We need to have property tax reform. Okay. Um, let's go back to the federal government. Um, Eric asks, um, what are you planning to do about Pennsylvania driver's license that are not going to be valid identification for air travel inside the U.S.? Uh, that's upon us. Yeah, he's, uh, Eric's talking about the Real ID program. And um, uh, I actually, that, I forget, Act 38 was, was uh, established many years ago before I was governor. Uh, but the consequences are coming due now. So I called to then Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, and asked for an extension. Uh, and, and he agreed to give the extension until June. 
uh, as long as uh, I could get a letter signed by the majority leaders of the Senate and House, and I would sign it saying, we will work very hard to get the repeal of Act 38. Uh, and that, I think, this, it starts in the Senate, and, and they are uh, bound and determined to, to do that. Uh, if we get that repeal by June, then we have until, I think, the middle of October of 2020 uh, to actually uh, implement the, the, the program, and that will give us plenty of time to implement it. So the hope is that, that we actually can use our driver's licenses uh, to get into buildings, that we can use our driver's licenses to actually show our identification at airports. Okay, and I know PennDOT is, you know, at the front of this, and they're, they will keep Pennsylvanians informed of, of the different changes that yeah, they come about. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the, the legislature is working on this, and the hope is that, that we can actually uh, fix this. Um, let's talk about unemployment compensation. Anne from Harleysville says, what is being done about PAUC? This is not a, a giveaway. We pay an insurance premium and so do employers. Um, and there's no ability to get service when you need it. I mean, what do you, what do you say yeah, to that? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a fair point. Uh, we actually, just to give you some history, we, we actually um, uh, reformed the unemployment compensation system for seasonal workers, for cyclical workers. Uh, so that we added, uh, I think, 40 to 50,000 workers who were now eligible for, for benefits, and we did it without uh, uh, jeopardizing the solvency of the system. Uh, one of the details of that reform, which everybody, Republicans and Democrats, senators and representatives, signed on to, uh, was to keep the call centers open for an extra another year mm -hmm. and, and keep funding them out of the uh, unemployment compensation uh, reserve fund and the trust fund and and um, uh, when we actually agreed on how we would extend these benefits uh, a small part part of that was to authorize the governor and the labor and industry department to use <clears throat> money in the trust fund to keep the call centers open that passed the house overwhelmingly republicans and democrats got to the senate and they decided not to even vote on it so I'm ready to, to, to sign that as soon as it gets to my, my desk. In fact, I will drive in my Jeep anywhere, from anywhere, on vacation, a, a holiday, weekend, whatever, to get here to sign that because uh, that's all it takes. It, it's ready to go, and, okay. and the, 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 the bill is, is, is ready. So it's a, it is a sad uh, state of affairs that, that uh, the bill is there, the reform is there, but because uh, the money was not authorized uh, to uh, actually make the call centers function as they were supposed to function, uh, there are people who have to wait long, long hours to, to get the benefits they deserve. Okay. Um, just for anyone who's joining us, we are live on Facebook right now with Governor Wolf, and we're answering a whole uh, gamut of Facebook questions that are coming in from, from your viewers on Facebook. So let's trans transition a little bit to um, arguably the most important issue of your administration, which is education. Um, Robert from Erie says, I'd like to hear how you are addressing the per pupil discrepancy across Pennsylvania, where some school districts receive, he says, almost three times as much per pupil spending than on other schools. What do you say to that? Uh, that's a great question. We, we are trying to, uh, and I've worked with both sides of the aisle to produce a fair funding formula. Uh, the fair funding formula uh, is based on, it, it distributes funds based on the poverty rate, the, what is it, the number of children who speak uh, non-English language, uh, the uh, tax base of the uh, of the area, the number of children enrolled in charter schools, takes all those things into account uh, to give a certain uh, a percent, a number of dollars. Now the fair fu funding formula <coughs> only um, uh, uh, relates to new dollars going into education since I became governor. Right. Uh, so I've put now um, 400, 500 million dollars, new, new money in, I'm proposing another 200 million dollars this year. So. Um, it would it would uh, apply to to those new new dollars, uh, but it would uh, try to to make sure that we're we're giving the areas of greatest need uh, the most money. Okay. 
And transitioning again to rural health, um, Emily from Lancaster says the U.S. is facing a looming shortage of physicians. By 2025, there will be a deficit of 60,000 to 90,000 providers. So what is Pennsylvania doing to ensure an adequate supply of physicians in the future? It's a great question. The, the, um, I think one of the problems we face is, is not just physicians in general, but physicians in certain specialties like family practitioners, primary care specialists, uh, or in short supply. Uh, and part of that has to do with, I think, the nature of tuition rates in medical schools, and the state needs to do something uh, there, I think. Uh, but we're also working to make sure that, that rural, uh, there, there's a geographic spread. Some of the doctor, the shortages uh, are most evident in our rural areas. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that uh, we do a good job of, of su supporting rural health centers. Um, the Department of Health uh, and the Department of Human Services have both been working with uh, the uh, Health and Human Services, I think, at the federal level to, to uh, secure some funding to help us um, uh, support rural health uh, centers. Uh, the uh, Again, the Affordable Care Act that uh, gives Medicaid to uh, people, in many cases, who use rural health centers uh, to actually reimburse those rural health centers for the health care. So there are a lot of things that we're trying to do, um, but it's it's a physician shortage issue that's looming. Uh, there's also uh, the, the, the issue of, of geography. There are certain areas where that shortage is most acute, and I think there's certain specialties. So we're, we're trying to do work with all those things to, to try to address that issue. Okay. Um, marijuana. Liz from Erdenheim, I hope I'm saying that right, says, is there any way Pennsylvania can follow Colorado's example and gain their amazing budget surplus over a quarter billion dollars by legalizing marijuana? Yeah, here, here's what we're, we're doing. We've legalized medical marijuana. I ran on the legalization of medical marijuana and on the decriminalization of recreational marijuana. And I think that, that uh, both of those things will, uh, the first will produce some revenue, the second uh, will reduce the expenditures on things like prisons and our legal system. Um, uh, I think um, personally that we ought to wait to see what happens in Colorado and Oregon and Washington to see how that, that actually works out uh, before we, we move beyond what I've said I wanted to do and, and what we've already, much of which we've already done. Okay. Um, on to sort of back to your budget, uh, this year's budget. Um, David from Fr Frizzleburg says, what, uh, what, hope, what do you hope to accomplish, he says, by raising minimum wage, knowing the effects it will have on the economy and that uh, however high you raise it, it, that will always be the wage then? Right. I think uh, w what you're trying to do with the minimum wage is, is adjust it to a point that actually helps the economy, not hurts it. Obviously, and his point is if you raise it too high, it's not, not a good thing. But raising it uh, uh, to the, the right amount, whatever that is, I'm, I'm proposing $12 an hour, uh, actually puts, in, in this case, uh, depending on your estimate, uh, uh, maybe two, even more, $2 billion more into the economy. Uh, and so that's two billion more dollars that people have to spend on things like pizza and Big Macs and, and uh, food in the grocery store or clothing or items in the, in the dollar store. It, these are things that, that uh, uh, actually add to the, the economic uh, uh, vitality of Pennsylvania and uh, in terms of taxation should be worth anywhere from an additional 60 to 100 million dollars between personal income tax and the sales tax. So the economic activity is, is, is what you're trying to, you, you also should save money with a minimum wage. Right now you can work full time, the minimum wage in Pennsylvania is seven dollars and 25 cents an hour. At that rate you work 2,000 hours a year and you're still going to qualify for things like food stamps or the children's health insurance program. Both of those things cost taxpayers money. Uh, so a minimum wage to a reasonable level would actually increase economic activity and save the government uh, and all of us as taxpayers from having to spend money on social services. And that's something you've been behind since day one. And, and last been. year you traveled the state and you met with a lot of, of business owners. And it seemed like <clears throat> you got a, a good reception. I and did. Well, and also I was a business owner. I, 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 paid well above the minimum wage, and minimum wage was not something uh, uh, 
that that would uh, uh, be a problem, I think, for for uh, business owners. This is something that actually, on the whole, in the aggregate, would actually increase demand, which would be a good thing for business. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, let's go to Sheila's uh, question, and I'm going to read it verbatim. She says, Dear Governor Wolf, thank you for voicing your support for better funding for adults with disabilities. I would like suggestions now from you on how families of the disabled can help make the legislature make the changes you've asked for. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think the best thing is to contact uh, your state senator, your state representative, and say, I, I really support uh, increasing funding for adults with uh, disabilities, and, and I, I hope that, that you will support the governor in, in uh, making uh, uh, these increases come true. All right. Okay, pensions. You ready for that? Okay. Sure. Uh, Claudia? Uh, doesn't give a location, um, but she asks, what are you going to do about the crippling pension program? And we heard this from a lot of the, the, our viewers on Facebook. And she says, P pensions are killing us in taxes. State employees just need to switch to a 401k just like the rest of us. Uh, and that's a, 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 a good suggestion. I think uh, uh, state employees uh, uh, are willing to, to go to a defined contribution plan. That's what a 401k is. Um, the uh, House Democrats and Senate actually passed uh, a bill that would be a, um, a hybrid that would have a combination of both defined benefit and defined contribution. Uh, so did the Senate. They were not able to reconcile and get to a point that both of them could agree on. But uh, I'm, I'm ready to, to uh, sign a, a pension bill that does three things. It reduces the risk, reduces the expense for the, the, the Commonwealth, and and is fair to employees. I think those are things that that, uh, uh, that we need, and, and I think the, the, she's right that, that uh, we can do this with a defined contribution plan. We just need to do it the right way. Let me just point out that the reason, the big reason we have this uh, deficit uh, is only partially because of the defined benefit uh, design of the plan. The big reason we have this unfunded liability is because the Commonwealth for many, many years did not pay its bill. And so we now have to make up for the, the uh, lack of uh, work that was done in the, in the past. So it doesn't matter what the design is, uh, we have a big liability and, and uh, that's going to be there no matter what kind of plan we come up with. Uh, PJ from Edgeley says, when you were being elected, one of your key points was you would place taxes on the fracking industry here in Pennsylvania, and yet nothing has passed so far. So what are you doing to get any bills passed that will place taxes on these fracking and pipeline industries? Well, I've been working, the, the, each of my budgets, I proposed a, a severance tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the first two years, they were, were not accepted by the legislature. Uh, I again propose the severance tax in this budget, uh, and uh, my hope is that, that uh, eventually uh, the, the legislature will uh, agree with the majority of Pennsylvanians that we need a, a severance tax. In the meantime, I'm also working to, to talk to the, the industry and, and say, you know, this is really something you ought to be for. Uh, you want people of Pennsylvania to share in the benefits of having this natural resource beneath our feet. Uh, and, and uh, applaud you for, for extracting it. And we can do that if, if some of the money that, that you're making uh, goes to fund our schools. Um, and by the way, Pennsylvania is the only major natural gas producing state without a severance tax. So there are a lot of good reasons why we need to get this and I'm hoping that maybe this year the legislature will see reason. And talk about what you're proposing this year. This year, uh, in my budget proposal, it was a 6.5% uh, tax uh, on the market value at the wellhead. Um, but you get 100% minus, 100% credit for the impact fee, which gas drillers are already paying. So the uh, uh, it's a, a, a reasonable tax. I understand John Kasich, Governor Kasich of Ohio, has proposed a much higher severance tax. <coughs> Uh, so we, we really ought to do this. It would, it would benefit uh, our children, our schools, uh, and be uh, 
uh, a nice uh, uh, aid to uh, our budget. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about animal abuse. That's something, if you tuned in to the local news at all here in Harrisburg, uh, over the last several months, we've heard a lot about House Bill um, 869. It, it's formally called Libra's Law. And um, Chris asks, is there any focus on HB 869 if that it makes it to, uh, to your desk? And I'm sorry, I'm going to paraphrase this one. Um, he says, is there more support across the board this time uh, for that Libre's law? And, and will you sign it if you get it at your desk? Well, two questions. First, yes, I will sign it if it gets to my desk. And, and I, I sort of thought it was going to get to my desk last time around because I think it, there, there should be very broad support for this. this. This makes perfect sense. So I'm not sure. Uh, why it didn't get to my desk, but yes, I will sign it if it gets gets there. Okay. All right, back to your budget and, and a big one in your budget. Um, Eric from Warren says, with the consolidation of the human services departments, such as the Department of Aging, what will happen to the area agencies on aging in all the counties? Will they stay in place as is? Uh, will many people be put out of work? And will the elderly le be left without advocates? Absolutely not. The, the, the consolidation of the uh, four different agencies uh, is an effort to actually improve services. So um, uh, uh, the uh, area agencies on, on aging, uh, I think, uh, should see and their clients should see better uh, service as a result of this. And I look back at, at the things we've done best um, for our citizens. Um, have been where agencies have actually worked together, uh, like the opioid crisis, substance use disorder crisis. Uh, that's actually a partnership of the Department of Human Services, Department of Health, Department of uh, uh, Aging, and Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. All those agencies work together and I think have done a, a good job in helping Pennsylvania get its arms around the, the substance use disorder, the opioid epidemic. Uh, and I see the same thing for, for uh, aging. Uh, the Department of Aging uh, is, a, is a strong champion for, for the elderly. We need that kind of championing of, of the elderly in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to figure out a, a way to do it even better than, than we're doing it right now. And I think, I think this consolidation will help us do that. And another um, one we've gotten a lot of questions about regarding this year's budget, um, Lonnie from Sweet Valley, uh, he, he's asking about the $25 fee uh, to fund the Pennsylvania State Police that cover municipal areas that don't have their own police forces. That's something that you proposed in this budget. Um, just talk about that a little bit and, and, and the reasoning behind why the Commonwealth uh, it needs to go this direction. Sure. I, th there are two things. First of all, this is something that uh, more and more municipalities are opting for and, and who can blame them? Uh, right now the rule is that, that if you have your own police department and you want to move to the state police coverage you can do that for free. Uh, so you, you reduce your own expenditures by eliminating your police department and simply move to the state police coverage. Um, and uh, we all know there's nothing that's free. There's, and, and, and so uh, that, that's a problem for everybody else who is uh, uh, helping to pay for, defray the cost of, of that. The second thing is the, the way the, the, um, that cost is defrayed is that we end up with fewer bridges and roads that are repaired or built. Uh, the money that, that is being used by the Pennsylvania State Police uh, to fund this free service, this coverage, uh, is basically coming out of Act 89 money, money that happened, a tax that was put in place before I came uh, into office. Um, but uh, it, it means that, that every municipality that signs up for this free state police service, the rest of us, all of us, get uh, fewer bridges and fewer roads repaired. So that it's not sustainable. We need to, to move on. And $25 per head is, is, is a very, very small uh, charge compared to what municipalities with their own police forces are paying. And that's the municipality would pay that? Yeah, but presumably they would, they would uh, pass it through as tax to their, right. their citizens. But, but one way or another, all of us are paying for this coverage, whether through the sales tax or the income tax or the opportunity tax that we owe, the opportunity 
foregone of, of having bridges and roads that uh, are up to snuff. Okay. Um, on to the opioid uh, crisis that we've talked a lot about over the last uh, you know, several years here. Je Jeannie from Natrona Heights um, had asked about uh, concerns that, again, with the consolidation of the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs into a larger Health and Human Services Agency, um, will that make things harder? Will that you know, kind of stall efforts uh, to fight this epidemic? No. If I, I, I knew if, what you'd say. Yeah, <laughs> no, if I thought, if I thought it were going to were to would make things harder I wouldn't have done it the um, the idea behind uh, breaking down these agency barriers these these walls and silos is to actually improve service uh, and I look at what we've done so far in the opioid epidemic and I think we've done some good we have a lot of work to do but but we've gotten some good things done and that's because people in the drug and alcohol Department of Drug and Alcohol programs and the Department of Human Services and Health and Aging they've all worked together and, and they've, they've focused on what's right for the, 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 the citizen rather than, you know, how does this support uh, some body who decided who, how, who knows how many years ago that we ought to have a separate agency for this and a separate agency for that. I want to help the citizens of Pennsylvania. I want to do what's best for the citizens rather than uh, what's best for some accident of history. Um, continuing on that topic, Julia says, are there any new plans to manage the rising overdose rates in the state? Narcan availability is a start, but does the state intend to address the addiction issue itself with rehab facilities, community outreach? We must do more to solve the problem rather than just treat the symptoms. Right. Do you agree? I agree, absolutely. And, and I think if, if you look at what we've been doing, uh, we created 45 centers of excellence treatment centers um, last year. The last ones are just getting up and running now. So this will be the first calendar year where we basically had them up and running. And the hope is that they will be able to address the needs of 11,000 Pennsylvanians who are suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, but we need to do more. Uh, we need to, to have more treatment centers. We need to have more uh, options for uh, sufferers of substance use disorder. We need to uh, do more to give medical professionals more um, resources. Uh, uh, naloxone is, is uh, Narcan is, is, is just one thing. It, it, it brings a person back from uh, an overdose, but then you have to make sure that that, that person has treatment options or, or you haven't done really anything. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I put uh, 10 million extra dollars into my budget this year uh, on top of the what 20 million additional dollars I put in last year uh, and with bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House I believe Pennsylvania is one of the leaders in the country in terms of trying to address this. One other, one other thing, uh, we need to address the stigma of this. This, this is a disease yeah. And I think uh, one of the things about bringing this out into the open is that, that we're, we're saying this is a disease. We know how to treat it. There should be no one who dies of this disease in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you've, you're very passionate about this I topic. Am. You've made that clear. I am. All right, let's lighten things up just a little. We're live here on Facebook with Governor Wolf answering your questions. And uh, we had one come in from uh, Pennsylvania mayor of Coriopolis. Uh, I guess he goes, but Tony Celeste. Tony, yeah. Yeah. And he says, Governor Wolf, make a stop in Coriopolis. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it on the schedule. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to Erica from Downingtown. Um, she wants to know where we are in terms of equality for all Pennsylvanians in the area of employment, healthcare, housing, public accommodations, as it relates to LGBTQ community. And I'm just gonna read what she wrote too because I think it's uh, important. Every Northeastern state has anti-discrimination against sexual orientation and many don't allow discrimination against gender identity or expression. PA has neither. Are we behind? Yes. Uh, we have a uh, ruling in federal court uh, that goes back May of 2014 uh, that um, uh, allows for uh, uh, same-sex marriage and, and marriage equality in Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania still does not have legislation on non-discrimination, and I think that is appalling. Uh, it, it is uh, Pennsylvania really has to to move in, not not just to be with other states, but because it's 
it's the right thing to do. We, we need to have non-discrimination legislation. Uh, there are some good bills uh, in the General Assembly, and I'm hoping that, that uh, they will pass. As soon as they get to my desk, I will sign them. Okay. Um, we're going to hurry along the last couple here because we're running out of time. We have uh, covered a uh, lot of ground. Okay. Um, Joseph from Wilkes-Barre um, says, you mentioned a retirement incentive to reduce the state employee workforce. What is the incentive, and will that help pension reform? Uh, the, the what is it uh, has not been worked out and will be worked out with employees and the legislature it takes legislative uh, uh, action to make a presentation. But obviously, it's one that's going to have to be uh, fair to the employees or they, they won't want to take it. Uh, and that's the nature of early retirement. It's, it's voluntary, it's up to the, the employee, and, uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to make it one that is attractive. Uh, it, it probably uh, won't make much of a difference in terms of the unfunded liability, uh, but it, it will uh, actually help in terms of the immediate, uh, the short-term expenses, actually the long-term expenses in terms of helping us uh, streamline government to, to figure out how we can get to the point where we're actually doing more for our citizens uh, with, with less. Early retirement is a portion of that, that strategy. Okay. Um, Adam from Altoona um, says, Governor Wolf, have you thought about the financial benefits of a statewide veterans court? Yeah, I'm not, sh sh the way the, uh, I should be a better constitutional scholar, but I think the way we, we do it, the, the, the nature of courts uh, are really under the uh, direction of the, uh, the counties. And so the way it's been done so far is that each county uh, determines whether it's going to have a, a drug court. One of the things in my budget is to <clears throat> provide financial assistance to counties who are considering drug courts. So I think they're a good thing. And I think the people who have gone through drug courts or the uh, people in the legal uh, uh, profession believe that these are, are good things um, but I don't think I could do that on the I don't think I could have a state drug court but I'll certainly look into it it's good to get input from yeah. from our Facebook fans yes, yes. Um, Judah from um, the pokers player po pokers players Alliance says thank you for the opportunity to ask about the budget's reliance on revenue from online poker when when, that's always the good one, when will legalization and regulation occur? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, the, again, there is a, uh, uh, there, there's real work being done in the General Assembly as to what enhanced gambling, including online gambling, including possibly online poker, uh, would look like moving forward. Uh, the, the deal is that whatever we do on, on this enhanced gaming, uh, it should not uh, take business away from uh, their casinos or the lottery uh, or the, otherwise why would we do it because we're already getting revenues from from that uh, it should be something that that can be implemented cleanly uh, and that, that uh, the oversight would be uh, uh, we, could, we could do without being really that intrusive so th there are a lot of details that have to go into this I know other states have done online poker uh, and have done it successfully uh, we need to keep learning what we can from from those states okay i think we are out of time okay um so we've covered a lot of ground today and unfortunately again we are running out of time i want to thank you thank you so much for joining us here today and thank you for logging on for the governor's latest facebook town hall and of course to learn more about governor wolf's budget proposal don't forget to follow him on facebook and twitter he's very active on there yes i appreciate that and thank you very much for having me on All right. thank you